innovation. How much innovation? There's been lots of talk about innovation today, Donald, isn't there? Sure is. Well, talk to me a little bit just about, about Bell Labs and the, the journey of, of Bell Labs and its relationship to creativity and to culture. And it started very early on, didn't it? Yeah, Bell Labs is about 90 years old. You might have heard Marcus earlier uh, speak about some of our legacy and in innovation. And um, we really have a strong history from a research and development point of view, but we also have a very strong history that some don't know about in what we call experiments in arts and technology. So way back when, long before STEAM became a thing to talk about, we had researchers in residence, and we uh, collaborated with lots of the biggest artists in the world at the time, like Rauschenberg and Cage and um, various artists like that as well. So there's the a long history Cage, of us yeah. partnering with uh, the artistic community to help drive the development of our technology. And how did you end up in Bell Labs in Murray Hill, having grown up in a traditional Irish music household in Gortine in County Sligo? Yeah, a bit of a twisted path, maybe. Um, I ended up in Murray Hill in New Jersey because Marcus Weldon asked me to move over, and he's the boss of Bell Labs. You don't say no to him. He's persuasive, yeah. is he? Uh, but uh, in reality, so I had a number of roles in research in, in the lab here in Ireland, and uh, we had worked on a lot of new technologies, and we'd always had a keen eye for design and how we can have a better engagement between our technology and the user of the technology. And that kind of link between my training as an aeronautical engineer deep in the sciences and engineering, but my natural link to the arts through my family upbringing and also this need to always connect our technology to people is kind of what brought me uh, to where I am today in New Jersey. And you talked to me a little bit about um, human-centered design. Talk to me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so it's very, I mean, it's extremely important. Lots of people talk about it, but there's, it's a very difficult thing to achieve. And in our philosophy in Bell Labs, we have to solve the greatest human need challenges. And if you develop technology with that as your goal, then that's what you have to achieve. And there has to be a deeper connection between technology and the human, and technology really has to enable um, better things for humans. So one example is um, we often talk about how the way we communicate today as humans is quite limited. So, as you know, there's a deep connection between us because we're in proximity to each other. But are you saying that this is not enough? I think this, this is enough between us here in cl close proximity. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, but the question is, if I'm in New Jersey and you're in, and you're in Dingle, yes, how can sir. we have this connection over a distance using technology? How can we share emotions and share experiences? And how can we have a deeper connection that will break down barriers between different human beings? And that's the kind of way we think we can and should develop technology to help uh, better communication between us. So you're, driv you're driven by transmission, really, aren't you? Uh, yeah, transmission, yeah. translation, uh, sharing of emotion, uh, deeper connection between people. That's very important to us. Uh, Donald, when you were growing up and before you became absolutely seduced by planes up in the air and all of that aeronautics, the sounds that were dropped into your ear were sounds that were made by your own family, by your own people, by your father, who was a, a remarkably gifted um, accordion player, and his brother, a great flute player, um, Marcus. And you absorbed those tunes, and they were transmitted to you in this way that we're speaking now, that when we sing and play for each yeah. other, there is an exchange that happens that is profoundly human. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's a hidden thing to most, unless you're involved in it yourself, but that transmission of the story and the context and the history, and then the transmission of the tune, and then the link between the tune and the story you just heard very personal to the person, and how you can then hear that emotion come out in the plane of the tune based on the story you just heard, and, and the story that that tune carried sure. as well. It's all very interesting, and that kind of deep connection between, between people that can be transmitted in music, yeah. and the transmission of emotion through music is uh, something that's very important. And of course, the value of that is unquantifiable because it's probably priceless. It's what Seamus Heaney calls the given note. Mm. He doesn't talk about you know, the sold note or the exchange note or the bartered note. He talks about the given note, and it's almost like a gift. And that, those notes are, are, are held by us and are, I don't know, um, hugely emotionally empowering. Um, there's a fiddle here, and it would be a shame not to be picking it up. <laughs> Um, and, and, and maybe play, playing a tune. What, what, what will you play? I'll play a tune I got from my father. 
Great. Um, like did, you hear what he, did you hear what he just said? He, I said, I, I'll play a tune I got from my father. You know, it's, 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 it's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to correct my No, 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 my no. English. Not, not at all. <laughs> so this is a tune I got from my father, but in a similar way, I heard him <laughs> play it, and it just kind of hit me in the back of my head, and I had it straight away. You had it? Just, it was there. Yeah. I didn't have to learn it. It was just there. And it's a tune that always just kind of comes to me every so often. Yeah, that's because a funny it, thing, isn't it? You, it's almost you're absorbing it by osmosis yeah. of, of, in some way. Yeah, so there's a strange, deep connection between me and this tune. I can't quite understand it, but I'll give it a go. And this is Fidelma. Fidelma's very shy, so we'll <laughs> see if, we'll see if uh, Fidelma wants to help me out here. Right. So I've no name on this gun on him, as they say. So, let's fire away. Beautiful, soft, lilting County Sligo music. And a huge amount of Sligo music um, went to America and it found itself in the industrial cities of the eastern seaboard of the United States, um, in Philadelphia, in New York, um, in Chicago, and in Boston. And uh, that Sligo style became um, a very dominant style of Irish music because when Irish music went to America for the first time, it was encoded in America for the first time. It was up until that time, an orally transmitted music, something that we would do just like we're doing here. We would exchange it in real time. Every performance was different. Every performance was unique. Um, but when Irish music went to America, it collided with technology and was re recorded and encoded for the first time and sent back to us. And when it came back to us, of course, we listened to it very carefully and we probably copied it and it was played a little louder and a little faster and probably in a little more exciting way. And it was it, it just very interesting to see that our music was entirely affected transmission-wise by its engagement with technology. And as I said, I grew up in, in Cork City and um, it was, we used to refer to Cork City as um, being nestled on the Lee Delta we wanted to be sort of like blues men. And a lot of blues, a lot of blues music came up the Lee Delta. Um, and musicians like Rory Gallagher, who some of you here might remember, um, a great blues man. And uh, he grew up in Cork City and we used to hang out and look to see him play in all these small little clubs before he became famous and, and, and left. And uh, Donald played you a, a tune and I'm gonna sing you a song now. And, uh, this song was one of the first songs I ever learned. And I learned it in a music shop um, on McCurtain Street in Cork City. And um, I learned it again. I got the tune, or I got the song from somebody in a physical sense that actually sat down and said, wait till you hear this. I'm going to sing you this little blues song. And uh, it went into my ear. And the same as yourself, once I heard it once, um, it never left me. And um, it's a very short little thing. And um, it's a blues song, um, of course. And it's a song called The Factory Girl. And it's not to be confused with a song of the same name in the Irish tradition. Um, this is an, just, just an old blues lullaby, if you like. And it's a song, um, and the person in the song, sung by a woman, really. Um, somebody like Bernice Johnson Regan of Sweet Honey and the Rock that some of you might know. Um, a really remarkable singer in America who told me when we sat on a stage once that what singing does when you open your, your voice and your heart to sing is that it rolls back the fear and that when you're singing, you are present and nothing can get near you. She used to sing before um, rallies that Martin Luther King used to have, etc. So I'll sing this for her and, um, and maybe she's over there, Donald, and if the technology gets good enough, 
I could be doing this here and she might be feeling something um, over there. But we're, go we're, go we're going to come to talk about that in a moment. So here's a very short little thing for you, just called The Factory Girl. <clears throat> well, I ain't going to work in the factory And greasy up my clothes No, I ain't going to work in the factory and get those splinters in my toes. Pity me, my darling. Pity me, I say. Pity me, my sweet little darling. And won't you carry me? And I ain't gonna hear that old spinning wheel rolling round my head when other girls is hard at work. I'm gonna be home in bed. Pity me, my darling. Pity me, I say. Pity me, my sweet little. And I ain't gonna work in the factory, no And greasy up my clothes No, I ain't gonna work in the factory And get those splinters in my toes Pity me, my darling, won't you Pity me, I say Pity me, my sweet little darling, and won't you carry my blues, and won't you carry my 